For the past little while, I've been working on a little side project slash startup -y type of thing as a solo developer, and I wanted to share an update. Now, I made a video about this back in September, I think it was, talking about the tech stack as well as the data model, a little UI wireframing, things like that. But some stuff has changed, and so I figured it would be interesting to maybe revisit it and also talk about things a little bit more in depth, not so much the UI and the data model, although we'll talk about the data model at least, not so much the UI in a little bit but I wanted to talk about some stuff in a little bit more depth. So let's jump in. So this is what the, the website looks like right now. It's called Dev Cafe, spelled with a K. Uh, someone bought Dev Cafe with a C, the normal spelling. But uh, basically it is a cookbook for developers or the cookbook for developers. So the first thing that I'm working with is Next.js. Really the reason for using this one is because it works really, really well with Vercel. They both seem to be like two of the most mature frameworks and platforms for building web applications, specifically server-side rendered web applications. And so I started using it maybe six months ago or so, or eight months ago maybe, and I've really, really enjoyed it. I know that a lot of people like to kind of put down Next.js for various reasons, and I personally had a really great experience with it. and. I'm gonna keep doing it. Something to note though, is that there is a feature here in Next.js uh, routing. Let's see, route groups, route handlers, route handlers here. So I might use the route handlers feature, which is a way that Next.js allows you to build an API inside of your Next.js application and it will build the API for you. And I think it's really, really awesome that it does that basically making it full stack. So. I might use that at some point. The next one that I'm using, I mentioned already, is Vercel. So this is, I've decided, going to be my, my platform as a service uh, for the cloud to be able to host the website. Previously, I was going to use Firebase and their new service called App Hosting. And I, as I mentioned before in my last video talking about my tech stack for 2025, I went through this code lab trying to get Firebase and Next.js to work together to be able to provide authentication server-side and I just, it didn't work the way that I wanted it to. Something that's interesting, I think, to call out here is that I'm not using any of the extra, what I consider to be extra features that Vercel has. So what I would consider to be an extra feature, let's go down here to... So under Vercel Marketplace, this actually, they changed this. Um, this is now under the marketplace, but they used to have, it was called like storage or something like that. And they used to, they still do offer Postgres blob, which uh, I guess is still in beta Postgres key value, and then some other ones through the marketplace. These I think are largely now offered through their marketplace. Um, I think before maybe they were going to try and offer it in, via partnerships, but through their own platform, whereas now it seems it's more so a focus on the marketplace. I'm using Postgres for another project. I'm not using Postgres through Vercel for this project. And I'm not using the key value store at all. I don't use Superbase. I don't use Redis nor EdgeDB. Uh, and I don't use Blob. Somewhere here they also offer web analytics. I'm not using this. I'll talk about that one in a little bit here, but I'm not using web analytics through Vercel. Uh, I have it actually with another project, not this one. It's not as advanced as something like Google Analytics, which is the real, I think, part of the reason I don't use it. The other thing as well is that you have to pay for it. You have to pay extra for it, whereas Google Analytics is free. And I realize that Google Analytics has its own issues perhaps, and there might also be other best-in-class solutions that are better than Vercel and better than, um, uh, than, than Google Analytics. I know Amplitude is a really good one that I've used in the past. Uh, a heap, I think is a pretty good one. I've checked that one out in the past. I don't use them currently. Uh, I'm just gonna be using Google Analytics be mainly because it's free and I, I kind of have some experience with it. Okay, so for my authentication, I've decided to move away from Firebase Auth and go with Auth.js. Why did I decide to do this? Well, really it came down to the experience that I mentioned just a short while ago with Firebase and um, and their server-side rendered authentication or re authentication in a server-side rendered app. I really didn't like the experience that I had. And by that, I mean the experience left me with a product that didn't work. And I think that's not okay because one, Firebase is supposed to be a complete solution and two, you pay for it. And so I decided to give this a shot auth.js used to be called next auth and so 
the, the, the assumption there, the implication there being that it is specifically made to work with Next.js applications. And in fact, it is. They do call that out somewhere here in their documentation. But they have some, some expanding support for other frameworks as well, which is pretty great, I think, for future reference here. Um, and so I tried it out and it worked flawlessly. Didn't have any problems, especially it's, it's made, I think they support Vercel as a, as a native thing, a first class thing within this package, which was really, really incredible. Something else though that I wanna call out here is in terms of the data model, I did have to make a slight change. So originally I only had, I think like a pretty, pretty simple data model in which there was a single users table. And next auth, uh, kind of handles creating of users accounts and sessions for you. And so the way that they do it is that there is a single user. So users are, I can only have one user for Garrett Love, right? And then the account is specific to the OAuth method or the OAuth provider. Oh, something else about this here too, is that they support somewhere here, Edge. They support the edge. Uh, you do have to use a specific database and database uh, adapter that supports the edge. So it's not just AuthJS that needs to support it, but they do have support for edge uh, edge computing, which I think is great. Um, it speeds up the performance of your of your client, of your website, or your app, and I think that's a really awesome thing that you know we can all kind of benefit from. So Firebase, where does that leave me with Firebase? Because I had been like a really big proponent of Firebase for quite a while, to be honest. The only thing I'm really using Firebase for now is this product called Remote Config, which I have up here. Remote Config allows you to kind of build and use uh, feature flags in your application. I can do another video on what feature flags are, how they work, and why they're a really great thing. But that's really all that I'm using Firebase for. I'm no longer using Firestore um, with the uh, uh, the session strategy of the database session session strategy that I wanted to go with. I kind of thought that Firebase would be at a disadvantage because uh, your website is then going to be making a lot of calls to the database, whereas with Firebase you get charged for the number of calls to the database. You get charged for the number of reads, number of writes. And I was kind of worried that I would end up just being charged a lot because that is a transaction, not transaction, a read and write heavy approach to doing uh, your security, your authentication authentication uh, session. So deciding to use AuthJS instead of um, instead of Firebase authentication, deciding to not use uh, Firebase uh, Firestore and deciding to go with Postgres instead. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then deciding to go with Vercel to actually host the application instead of app hosting left me with this weird question of like, okay, what am I using Firebase for? The only thing I could really think of were this, the feature flags, and then also the cloud storage, which is basically like their version of S3. So, okay, cool. And I've used cloud storage before with Firebase and like credit to where credit's due, they do make it really, really easy to use. However, it's it would be in a different data center, a, a different, possibly a different region because I don't know that uh, that Vercel hosts in the same reason, regions as AWS does, even though they are AWS backed. Um, so it would be like a different location. It would be a different product altogether. It just, it kind of felt a little weird to be using Firebase cloud storage. And so I kind of made a decision not to use it, which then left me with this thing of like, well, what am I using Firebase for? And really the only thing that I could think of was this, this right here, this at this remote config. So the feature flags, right? Um, the only other thing is analytics. Now I realize that's not a Firebase specific thing. It is more of a Google or GCP thing. And so I'm kind of just lumping it in there. So I'm gonna go and use Google Analytics, which I guess is like, I mean, they have Firebase Analytics, but it is ultimately backed by Google Analytics. So yeah, the only things really that I'm gonna be using it for are Firebase Analytics because they have a nice real, they have a nice console that you can go in and, and look at stuff through, or I'll just go to Google Analytics directly. Um, but yeah, like that's, that's pretty much the only things I think right now that I'm using Firebase for. Kind of a shame because I really do love Firebase. So kind of coming off of that last one, talking about uh, Firebase cloud storage, how am I gonna be storing like blob? 
objects? Well, we're going to be using S3. I don't know that S3 is like as friendly for front end applications like Next.js or like a, a mobile app or something like that. S3 is a very, very widely known and well supported uh, product. And I think you can also use uh, their CDN CloudFront to be able to help out with the speed of things as well. And so hopefully I can maybe take advantage of that too. I mentioned the database before and I mentioned this thing called Neon. I mentioned it in my last video. I'm, I've mentioned it in this video and let's, I'll mention it again. Like let's talk about it. So this is a serverless branchable way to do Postgres. Um, I think I'm going to make a number of videos further on this product because I think it's really cool. So hint, hint, Neon, if you're watching and you want to sponsor this channel, that'd be awesome. Um, but I, I really, I was reading up on, on their branching strategy and how to, how to use it in your workflow. And I think it's really, really useful and helpful to be able to ship products faster when it comes to being able to spin up development environments, staging environments, testing environments, and then just remove them right away. And it seems as though you can do this a lot faster than you can if you were to have to maintain a seed file, maintain local data. I've done that before at, at previous positions and it's a bit of a pain in the butt. Next is Prisma. This is my ORM of choice. Uh, a lot of people don't like Prisma. They call it out. I've heard that it's slow. I've heard that the queries are not that good. Um, queries might not be that great. It might be slower. I haven't done any testing myself. I've really not played around with too many other things. I'm very open to trying other things, but ultimately if, if I, if I was doing this purely out of wanting to nerd out, I would go for the absolute fastest thing. Like in that case, I might just write my own sequel. That would be a lot of fun. I think genuinely as a solo developer and also therefore a solopreneur, I need either dev cafe or whatever I build separately from that. I, you know, I'm not going to just work on one thing. So dev cafe and any other ideas that I have, I really need them to, to turn a profit at some point. Right. And actually be able to pay for life, you know? And when you factor that in something like Prisma becomes really, really valuable because of the developer experience. Because of it, it can handle migrations. It can't handle data migrations at the moment. I think that's something I saw that maybe they're thinking about, but it can handle the, the schema migrations. Um, it helps you with all of your queries to make it easier for you to work with stuff. And so when you look at it through that lens, the total cost of ownership, which is that it abstracts away a lot and reduces that total cost of ownership is really, really important. And that largely is an extremely important thing in all of the technologies that I've decided to go with in, in this video and just in building products in general is what is the total cost of ownership? What is the development, the developer experience look like for me? And ultimately, can I build what I want to build as well as future proof myself to make sure that I can build anything in the future that I come up with as an idea that has really been at the forefront of making a lot of these decisions. And so while Prisma might get a lot of beef for being slow or for, I don't know, whatever, I'm still going to use it because of that total cost of ownership and developer experience that it provides. The last thing, and this isn't new, I think everyone kind of knows that this exists, but uh, GitHub uh, Actions for CI, CD, as well as uh, automation. I think I really like, uh, actually really like this design. I think this is a really nice design for the website, but um, I really like kind of, kind of, I don't know, it, it, the product, it's very well supported. It's, it's very popular and, you know, I, I don't really haven't had any issues. I've used other ones in the past. I've used, I don't know, this is like a lesser known one that I'll tell you about here. Um, I've used, well, I've used Bitbucket in the past, Bitbucket has their own CI CD product and that's fine. There's nothing really wrong with Bitbucket. It, it has a good amount of support. One that I've also used is code build. Now I haven't worked in code build in a pretty long time because uh, it was at a previous job, but this one caused a lot of frustration between me, other developers on my team and just the company in general. It's pretty slow. Um, AWS does this thing where like they give you the building blocks, but not necessarily a more complete solution. So you kind of have to build everything yourself. 
And that's fine because you can do more or less whatever you want, but it's also not fine again, because of that total cost of ownership and developer experience in which you just spend a lot of time doing things that other platforms give you for free. For example, we had a lot of issues with getting Slack alerts set up, whereas uh, GitHub, Bitbucket, they, I believe have that more kind of built in, uh, or maybe more, uh, more of a complete way to, to actually implement those solutions. So anyway, um, yeah, so that's why I've decided to use GitHub CICD, GitHub Actions. All right, thanks so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. If you think that I could be using any tech stack that is better or technologies that are better, things that I should check out, let me know down in the comments below. I'd be more than happy to, to check them out, though I make no promises that I will actually switch to them. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care, see ya.